Hey, what's up you guys? It's Dorothy and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to go into chapter 18 of One of Us is Next by Karen M. McManus. I hope that you guys are excited for this video and for what's to come. We are so close to being done with this book. We've got exactly 17 chapters, including this one, left to read. And then we're completely done with this book and can move on to our next book. Which, if we finish this one by the end of this year, um, that'll be, I think eight books we finished in this year maybe nine I'm not really sure I'd have to relook at my list and then go from there but anyways let's get right into this video this video may contain sensitive topics and foul language if you do not wish to continue please click off of the video now you have been warned chapter 18 May Thursday March 19th Cooper tenses winds up and hurls a blistering fastball across home plate the opposing batter looks like he's swatting at a fly when he misses, and the entire stadium erupts into cheers. The batter down on strikes, hurls his bat toward the dugout in frustration, and stalks away. Poor sport, Chris murmurs beside me, putting out an arm so Cooper's grandmother, seated on his other side, can lean against him while she gets to her feet for a standing ovation. She does it every time Cooper strikes somebody out, which has been a lot this game. It's the cutest thing I've ever seen. We're at Goodwin Field at Cal State Fullerton on Thursday night. Part of a capacity crowd watching Cooper's pitch game against UCLA, the stadium seating like a horseshoe around the field, and we're almost directly behind home plate in a section that's full of Bayview High students, past and present. I got a ride here from with Addie, who corralled Nate as soon as he showed up and is forcing him to be social. I think I caught a glimpse of Louis sitting with a bunch of Cooper's ex-teammates, but I looked away before I could be sure. After two weeks of total silence, I don't even know what I'd say if I ran into him tonight. My phone buzzes in my hand. I expect a text from Broen, who's been checking in on Cooper throughout the game, but it's just my mom asking what time I'll be home. I, can't, I still can't get used to how quiet my phone is ever since I disabled the ping me alerts. I'm glad I listened to Phoebe about that, especially since the Truth or Dare game ended on its own. I'd like to think whoever did it stopped out of respect for the fact that Brave U High is mourning Brandon, but it's more likely they just realized they'd lost everyone's attention. Every once in a while, I still wonder who was behind it all and whether they had a personal grudge against Phoebe Knox and me. But I guess that doesn't matter. My real problem is that I haven't figured out how to make things up to Knox. Now that I've managed to alienate both him and Luis, my social circle has shrunk once again to Broen's friends. Well, and Phoebe. At least she's still speaking to me. Cooper throws one of his infamous sliders and the UCLA batter just stands there looking confused while it's called a Cooper's called a strike. You might as well sit down right now, young man. Cooper's grandmother calls. You're already out. My mood lifts as a little as I lean toward Chris. Noni heckling batters might be my favorite thing ever. He smiles. Same. It never gets old. Do you think Cooper will go to the majors next year, I ask? Not sure. Chris looks extra cute in a green polo that brings out his eyes, his dark hair full of golden glints from sitting in so many baseball stadiums. He's totally torn. He loves being at school and the team he's and the team has been great, not just about baseball, but everything. Chris gestures wryly to himself. The majors, on the other hand, still aren't practically welcoming gay players. It'd be a tough transition, especially with all the added pressure, but the reality is his game won't advance the way it needs to if he stays at college level much longer. I watch Cooper on the mound, disconcerted by how impossible it is to recognize him from a distance. With his hat pulled low over his face, he could be anyone. How do you make that choice i ask almost to myself between what you need and what you want i feel like my sister's going through my going through her own version of that chris's eyes are on cooper too you hope they become the same thing i guess what if they don't i have no idea chris sucks in a breath as the batter makes contact with cooper's next pitch but it's harmless grounder and the shortstop feels easy the padres keep checking in he adds they really want him and they have a high draft position this year would it be an easier decision if he could stay local? He'd still have to travel a ton, obviously, but at least he'd be close to home. I don't mean Bayview exactly, and I think Chris knows that. He allows himself a small smile. It might. I smile back through a tangle of conflicting emotions. On one hand, it feels strange to be here with dozens of other Bayview High students in such a cheerful atmosphere two weeks after Brandon died. On the other, it's a relief to be focused on something positive for a change. I'm happy for Chris and Cooper because they deserve everything good, every good thing and I'm excited about their future. Not so much about mine though. I push up the sleeve on my long sleeve t-shirt to trace the outline of another bruise. I feel like a peach left too long on a window seal right before it collapses on itself, deceptively smooth on the outside but slowly 
rotting at the core and then I feel it moisture trickling through my nose again oh no not here I grab a tissue from my bag and press it against my face rising to my feet at the same time bathroom I say to Chris stepping over him and Nani with a murmured apology on my way to the aisle the steps are clear with nearly everyone in their seats I'm focused on Cooper so I'm able to make my way to the women's room quickly I don't look at the tissue until I'm in the stall with the door locked behind me bright red I collapse onto the toilet seat and tears come silently but so hard that my shoulders shake despite my best efforts at pretending none of this is happening it is and I don't know what to do I feel isolated hopeless terrified and just plain exhausted tears mixed with blood as I swipe the tissue after tissue over my face until I finally rip at least three feet of toilet paper out of the dispenser and bury my head in the entire thing both the tears and the nosebleed stop around the same time I say where am I I stay where I am for at least another inning, letting my breathing even out and my heart rate slow. Then I stand, flush the mass of tissue and toilet paper, and I leave the stall. I splash water on my face at the sink, starting staring at my reflection in the hazy mirror. Could be worse. My eyes aren't all that red, and I'm not wearing any makeup to smudge. I run a brush through my tangled hair, wash my hands, and step outside onto the concourse. The restrooms are around the corner from the concession stand, and the first thing I see is a small knot of familiar faces. Sean, Jules, Monica, and Louise. Jules is wrapped so tightly around Sean that she's in danger of spilling the tray of snacks he's holding. Monica keeps touching Louise's arm, batting her eyelashes at him. They're all laughing and joking like they're on the greatest double date of their lives and don't have a care in the world. For a second, I hate all of them. All right, man. Thanks, Louise says, handing something to Sean. I gotta go. Monica gives a flirty little pout. You're not leaving, are you? She asks. After we bought all these snacks, somebody's has to share the popcorn with me. No way, I wouldn't miss Coop. I'll see you guys back in the seats, okay? The other three turn away, still laughing, and Louise heads in my direction. I should duck into the women's room again, but my legs refuse to cooperate. He stops a few feet away from a few feet away when he spots me. Maeve, hey. His brow furrows as he looks more closely. Everything okay? Maybe my eyes aren't quite as normal as I hoped. Fine, I say. I cross my arms and push the memory of my crying spell in the bathroom. He's an asshole, you know what louise turns around like he thinks i'm talking about someone behind him who sean he's been horrible to Knox and phoebe and other people oh yeah well we played ball together so he shrugs like that's the only explanation needed my temper spikes and i'm glad for the distraction so you're bros i say sarcastically awesome louise goes still his eyes narrowing what does that mean it means you're all you all stick together don't you dude bros unite and all who cares about anyone else my skin prickles with residual fear misplaced angst and something else i can't put a name to i guess he can do whatever he wants as long as he throws a ball far enough dude bro louise says flatly that's what you think of me that's what you are i don't even know what i'm saying anymore all i know is it feels good to unleash some of the frustration that's been building inside me for weeks his jaw ticks i see is that why you dropped off the face of the earth i didn't i pause okay maybe i did but he didn't knock himself out looking for me either my nose tingles and the dread rushes out of my spine another nosebleed is going to start again soon i can tell i have to go enjoy your popcorn oh so that's the other thing i'm feeling jealous hang on louise voice is commanding enough that i pause his shoulders are squared his face is tense i was hoping to run into you tonight i wanted to get your number finally my heart does a stupid leap despite itself and crashes back down when he adds now that i know that you feel how you feel about dude bros i won't bother you but there's still something i want to send you it's for Knox, actually but you're the one here so he pulls his phone out of his pocket can you tell me your number once you have these you can go ahead and delete me from your phone or your life or whatever i seized my with regret but also with the certainty that i'm about to start bleeding in front of him i recite my number quickly and louise presses a few keys before putting his phone away might take a while to come through their big files tell Knox. i hope it helps he strides away just as a trickle of blood escapes my nose it starts to fall faster even dripping onto my shirt but i don't move to wipe it away i don't know what just happened other than the fact that i was horrible to louise for no good reason and trampled whatever might have been going on between us straight into the ground which sucks but it's not even close to my bigger problem right now Maeve, what the fuck I look up to see Nate carrying a full cup of soda in each hand, his eyes flicking from my face to the blood on my shirt. I've never told him what nosebleeds mean for me, but from the look on his face, Rowan did. Something breaks inside me, and before I can get a hold of myself, I start crying again. 
Nate tosses both sodas into a nearby trash can without another word. He puts an arm around me and leads me out of, to the main concourse to a side area with a few sick scattered picnic tables it's not private exactly but we're the only ones there he sits us both down his arm still wrapped around my shoulders i collapse into him sobbing against his chest for i don't know how long nate keeps pulling crumpled napkins out of his pocket until he runs out and i have to press them together in a damp blood-stained mess all i can think while i clutch nate's jacket and he keeps a steady hand on my arm is that i'm finally not alone with this when i sit up last wiping my eyes he says broen didn't tell me I dig a tissue out of my purse and blow my nose. She doesn't know. Nark's dark blue- Nate's dark blue eyes widen. Your parents didn't tell her? They don't know either. Nobody does. Maeve, what the fuck? He says again. It doesn't seem like the sort of comment that needs a reply, so I don't. But doesn't this- I mean, just to make sure I'm understanding things here, this is something that happens to you when you relapse, right? I nod, so you can't- you have to. Why, why would you keep something like this to yourself? My voice is low and hoarse. You don't know what it's like. What What's like, Nate asks. Relapsing. Tell me. It's just, everything changes. Everyone is sad. Normal life stops, and we all climb on this miserable treatment roller coaster that only goes down. It's horrible, and it hurts in every way possible, and the worst thing is, it doesn't work. I'd start crying again if I weren't completely spent. I sag against Nate's shoulder instead, and his arm tightens around me. It never works for long. Four years is the longest ever i thought maybe i'd never have to do it again and i don't know if i can nate is quiet for a few seconds okay he fi he says finally i get that but this is your life Maeve. you have to try don't you think i'm so unbelievably tired if i closed my eyes now i'd sleep for days it's not a comforting thought i don't know if you don't if you won't do it for yourself then do it for your family okay nate's voice gets urgent think about your mom and dad and Brown, how they would feel if you if something happens, they'll drive themselves crazy, wondering whether things could have been different if you trusted them enough to tell them. I stiffen. It's not about trust, but that's what they'll think. I don't reply. Nate presses. You know it's what Broen will think. She'll blame herself for not being here, for not guessing, and it will eat her away for the rest of her life. Damn him. He just poked my Achilles heel, and he knows it. When I sit up, he already looks relieved. Fine, I mutter. I'll talk to my parents. As soon as I say it, a wave of relief crashes over me, washing away some of the dread that's been building up for weeks. It hits me, then how badly I've wanted to tell them, but I've let myself get frozen with fear. <coughs> Excuse me, an indeci indecision. I needed a push. It exhales a long breath. Thank Christ. You need to do something for me in return, though. I warn. He raises his eyebrows, quizzical. Get your head out of your ass when it comes to my sister. Nate's surprised laugh breaks the tension enough that I smile too. Listen, Maeve, you don't have to worry about Broen and me. We're in game. I wipe a stray tear from the corner of my eye. What does that mean? It means we'll wind up together eventually. It might take a year for us to sort everything out, or two, or ten, whatever it'll be, but it'll happen. Maybe you should tell her that, I suggest. He gives me that famous Nate Macaulay grin that always turns my sister into a puddle. She knows. She might not admit it yet, but she knows. That is the end of chapter 18. I will see you guys in the next video. And yes, that did make me tear up a little bit because uh, you would, like, you would expect Nate to be like that for Broen, if it was Broen, but not for anybody else. But he's got a soft side to him, so it made me tear up a little bit. But I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!